You are listening to Perplexity. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I am your host, Kadra, and if you're new here, hello and welcome. I tell tales every single week that have perplexed me. So if you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, don't worry, you are in the right place. And if you end up enjoying today's episode, I would love it so much if you continue to follow along. And if you are a returning listener, hello, my friends, welcome back. So happy you're here. And I have a wild story for you guys today. Today is going to be a little bit different. If y'all are watching on YouTube, you will notice there is no video this time. That is because I am taking a little bit of a break. So what we are doing today is something I have never done before, which is exciting. This is a Patreon leak. So I have a full episode where I talked about the Hell Camp documentary, talked about it for over an hour, and also read up on the story as well through some articles. So that is what you guys are about to listen to. And if you end up enjoying it, I would love if you guys join the Patreon because that's a great way to support the show and you get tons of perks. You can get exclusive bonus content. Depending on what tier you join, you can also get some free merch. So that's always fun. And with that in mind, I wanted to wish Scott a very happy birthday, one of my patrons. Happy birthday, Scott. He is a perplexed society supreme leader, meaning he is at the highest tier and he is going to get a t-shirt soon since he has been in that tier for several months and uh, was a patron before that as well. If you are a patron for six months at that tier, you get a t-shirt. So I hope you had a great birthday, Scott. You're awesome. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Trigger warning for today's episode. This episode is going to contain disturbing content. It is not for children. Listener discretion is advised. And as always, all of the sources that were used for today's episode will be down in the show notes. I'm excited because today is the first time that I'm covering a documentary. So I am covering, as per y'all's request, the Hell Camp documentary on Netflix. So you can totally watch uh, this if you haven't seen it. I would encourage you to. I do want to say trigger warning for this episode because we're going to be getting into abuse, suicidal attempts, and sexual assault. So listener discretion is advised. So this is Hell Camp Teen Nightmare, and it was directed by Liza Williams. Okay, so let's get into it. In the 1980s, there was this huge rise in substance use, and this basically started a moral panic across the U.S. A lot of this was because of the media and the first lady at the time, Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan went on to talk about, like, issue these extreme warnings of drug and alcohol abuse and how this was a big epidemic. Uh, It was affecting our children and no one was safe from it. So all of these desperate parents who are trying to take care of their kids and make sure that they're doing everything they can to prevent something like this from happening to them, they're turning to all of these outside quote unquote professionals, like what can we do about this problem? Or if my kid already has substance abuse, like what, how do I handle this? So one of the big things that a lot of parents started turning to was a concept known as wilderness therapy. And these therapy programs were designed to allegedly instill discipline and treatment to troubled teenagers. So in the documentary, it's called Hell Camp, but the camp that we're going to be talking about today was actually known as the Challenger Foundation Camp, and it was founded by Steve Cardisano. So Steve became the founder and president of this foundation in 1988, and he set up shop in southern Utah. And a lot of crazy things go down in Utah, so this is fitting. Cardasano was born in August in 1955 in Modesto, California. So he is a Leo. And he uh, was a retired U.S. Air Force instructor and a military special forces officer. So, very fitting. His philosophy was like this 
disciplinarian type of approach. And his words were that he wanted to break children down and build them back up again. Cardasano had also been given up by his parents as a baby, and he was adopted by a couple named Troy and Inez, but his bio parents ended up taking him back later in life when he was a toddler. Cardasano's mother was a heroin addict. She was in and out of prison. She had a lot of issues herself, and she was actually killed when Cardasano was only 17. His father was also physically abusive and had a bad temper. And Cardasano, understandably, was struggling in school, and he didn't really have a direction in life because he was never given one by his parents. So he decided that he was going to join the Air Force. And Cardasano claims that the Air Force ultimately saved his life because it gave him rules, structure, responsibility, and stability. He was also really passionate about media, and he studied film in college. During this time, he ended up meeting a woman named Debbie. They soon got married and had four young children. And this was all at the time that he would then start this camp. So the Challenger Foundation and the camp that he set up for this, they became really popular in the 80s and 90s, making millions of dollars just within their first year of operation. So The documentary kind of sets the stage for all of this, and then we start in August of 1989 with 15-year-old Nadine woken up in the middle of the night with two men standing over her bed. So 15-year-old Nadine has no idea what's going on. All she knows is these two full-grown strangers are in her room. So obviously, I'm sure her first thought was, oh my gosh, I'm being robbed, or oh my gosh, these people are going to kill me. So these two strangers kidnap her, and they said that if she tried to run, they would handcuff her. So she complies, and they throw her in this car, and they take her to the airport. They then put her on a private plane, this 15-year-old girl, with no explanation. Once they land, she was then put into a car with two people who identified themselves as Mad Cat and Mad Dog. And then they drive her to the middle of the desert, in Utah. And this is where she was handed a note from her parents that said, quote, we are sorry, we love you. And this is when Nadine is informed that she is at a camp created by the Challenger Foundation. And in the documentary, you see videos of like military style treatment to these children who have no fucking idea what's going on. They're being yelled and screamed at basically by like a drill sergeant. And this drill sergeant is Lance Jagger, also known as Horsehair. So Nadine, when she's being interviewed as an adult, she's talking about all this and this horrific experience she had. In my opinion, she clearly has a lot of trauma and resentment from this experience, which is completely understandable. And she's saying that like her mom had been trying to get rid of her since she was 12 years old. Nadine would often run away And she had a history of drinking alcohol, going to parties, and smoking pot. You know, things that a lot of teenagers do. They're trying to figure themselves out. They're going through a lot. I'm not saying that it's right to do these things, but I think that every teenager, for the most part, experiments with these types of things. So that's why it's important to be open with your children and build trust and communication with them so that, you know, they can understand what's safe and not safe. But I mean, I know for me, when I was 16, that's the first time I ever had alcohol. I didn't try drugs of any kind until I was in college. But, you know, to each their own, in my opinion. So at the camp, Nadine, along with the other children, would sleep outside on the ground. They had no tents. And she recalled a time that a girl asked her for gum out of her mouth because she was so hungry. So we'll talk about this more, but they were clearly starving. They're these children in the middle of the desert sleeping on the ground, and the girl asks for the gum out of her own mouth. That's how hungry these children were. Another child begged Nadine for a can of soup that she had in her backpack because he was so hungry. And she said that the hardest thing for her about being out there was knowing that her own parents did this to her. So in the documentary, Jagger, or Horsehair, talks about how 
he met Steve. So Jagger was from the Air Force, just like Steve was, and he strongly defends the practices that they had there to this day. So he was talking about how, like, They were doing it to keep these kids out of jail. They had to be hard on them because that's the only way that they would listen. So all these punishments were necessary and valid. That's his opinion. And they had a lot of loopholes because basically the way that they explain it in Hell Camp is the parents ultimately signed away their rights of their children and handed them over to these quote-unquote professionals running these camps. They also paid upwards of thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, usually around 16 grand, to send their kids here. Meanwhile, victims of the camp have compared this place to Lord of the Flies. So I have a quote here from Lance Jagger, Horsehair, that explains more of their thought process with the Challenger Foundation. So he says, quote, we didn't break them down to hurt them. We didn't break them down to punish them. We were breaking them down to rebuild, help them to be better, more positive person. Some of the kids were so scared they'd almost pass out. And that was fine by me because I wanted them to have little fear. A lot of these kids, this was it or they were going to jail, end quote. So that is the mentality of horsehair. I feel like that gives you an idea of who he was as a person. He's a hard ass, in my opinion. and was incredibly hard on these kids. So this camp involved a 63-day program and involved the children being forced to travel 500 miles in the desert. And they would travel through these three areas in southern Utah in the desert that they named. So they called these three areas primitive, teepee, and hand carts. And the hand carts area held all of their supplies. So they would literally go to this area and there were these giant like wagons that they had to pull manually. So the kids would like push and pull these carts for miles and it would have all their supplies on it. At one point, Steve Cartasano said that they had over 800 kids in this program and it turned around quote unquote hundreds of lives. And this translated into the camp making nearly $10 million because they were charging so much. So Cardasano is thriving. He is building this big foundation and helping hundreds of kids. And then he's profiting off of it. So he buys this big, beautiful home. It's 6,500 square feet. He gets all these luxury cars, including a Lamborghini. And his wife, Debbie, bought a horse. So those are not cheap. So this definitely gives you an idea of how much money they have. When Debbie's interviewed, she allegedly says that she didn't have access to the finances, which will come into play later. Uh, Horsehair said that the only way that the children could get access to food at this camp was by earning it. This was incredibly dry and dangerous terrain. The further that they hiked, the more privileges they got. So they would get access to food and water. Uh, The water holes were about 10 miles apart or further. So you can just imagine the conditions. And then, of course, these are kids. So they're not conditioned to be in an environment like this. This is like what people do when they're training in the military. And then on top of that, they're given MREs that have tons and tons of calories to help compensate for all the calories that they're burning. And these children were, like, starving. So it's pretty fucking ridiculous. They're, like, manual labor for these kids. They're abusing them and breaking them down. It's just horrifying. And then their parents turned them over to these camps. It's just, I cannot imagine. There's also a very upsetting scene in the documentary of the camp leaders killing an animal in front of the children quickly after they say to thank the Lord for this sacrifice. So they're performing animal sacrifices in front of these kids, and then they make the kids, like, cook and eat the animal. It was like a sheep or a cow or something, but really fucking disturbing, in my opinion. So one of the children at this camp, and the second one that they introduce in the documentary, is Kenny. And Kenny, when she went to this camp, was 13 years old. 
she recalls in the documentary that her mom and her would, like, argue all the time. They didn't get along. She was also struggling in school, and her father had recently passed away. So Kenny was very depressed, to the point that she even attempted to take her own life. There was another child at this camp named Matthew, and Matthew admitted that at the time he went to the camp, he was drinking a lot of alcohol. He was experimenting with drugs, so he was, like, smoking PCP and LSD, and he had also been arrested several times for drug possession. So Matthew's mom, Carrie, said that they had tried every punishment imaginable before sending him to this camp. So, you know, this this is really complicated because it's like you have these kids that it seems like th- these parents didn't know what to do with. And again, this is the 80s. So just having access to programs and like knowing why kids are this way, having like psychiatrists and psychologists that are adequately trained and like accessible is still a problem to this day. It was especially a problem in the 80s. So, you know, I I think it'd be easier to be angry at and blame the parents as you're watching this documentary, but I want, if you guys do watch it and like just as I'm telling the story, I do want you guys to really think of this as uh, like the parents were probably trying to help their children. I I think that they were coming from a good place. I think if anything, the blame should be on the camp because they alleged to be professionals and saw this need and took advantage of it. So, you know, just, just think about those things as we get into this story more and more and the discussion. So when Matthew got to this camp, he immediately was like, this is not for me. (laughs) I hate this. And he missed his McDonald's, Oreos, and round top ice cream, according to him, which same. I would definitely miss all of that. Matthew claimed that the adults at the camp told him that he could have a beer if he would like listen and do what he was supposed to do. Which was super confusing to me because isn't like the whole point of this camp to like help kids stop drinking? I'm confused. Matthew eventually has had enough of this camp. It's not for him. So like he recalls in the documentary that one morning when he was there, after they've slept all night outside in the dry desert, that, you know, the field directors waking them up at the ass crack of dawn and they're like, all right, come on, time to get up and time to walk because that's what they do all day is manual labor. And Matthew's exhausted. So he's like, I'm not getting up. So he lays on the ground. He's refusing to get up. And the camp leader is like, you got to get up. Come on. And Matthew's like, no, I'm not doing it. And this is when the camp leader struck Matthew across the face. And then another counselor comes over and basically things are escalating. They're like, you've got to go. you got to get up. And Matthew's even angrier at this point. And he's like, no, I'm not moving. Y'all cannot make me do this. And so this is when Matthew is then bound up by his ankles. And they began dragging Matthew across the rough terrain, across the rocks. They're cutting him. They're scraping the skin off of his back because he will not walk. And Steve Cardasano came out the next morning because he hears about all this. They're like, oh, this kid's acting up. He's not listening, blah, blah, blah. So Steve Cardasano wasn't always at this camp. He would just like come in and out. So he comes and goes as he pleases. And he showed up to basically like assess the situation. And he told Matthew that this was his fault. Matthew was quickly removed from the program after he was taken to the hospital. And Max Jackson the sheriff of Kane County, Utah, was notified about Matthew's injuries. So this is when a paper trail starts to build for the Challenger Foundation. So Max Jackson himself went and saw Matthew in the hospital, and Jackson said he was shocked by Matthew's injuries. Doctors found that Matthew was emaciated, and there were over 80 marks and contusions on his body in various stages of healing, 
which would indicate that he had been abused by the staff on multiple occasions. There were also other reports of children being tied to trees as punishment. So we're starting to hear some very disturbing whispers that are getting around about this place. Horsehair claims when he's talking about this abuse that he was furious about this and he had been very clear to the other directors to not abuse these kids. Meanwhile, on video, you see him at the very least verbally abusing these kids and getting in their faces. He also literally says that he promotes spanking and corporal punishment in his interview. So a little bit of a hypocrite. Matthew's mom, Carrie, flew out to where Matthew was in the hospital when she heard about all this because they live out of state. And the Challenger Foundation paid for Carrie's flight and hotel, and that's when she took him home. So it seems like they were trying to cover this up and make as little of the situation as possible. They were like, oh, yes, of course he can go home. And yes, of course we'll pay for these things. And as a result, Matthew's mom, Carrie, never pressed any kind of charges. The camp continued to grow in popularity, so they started getting tons and tons of kids there, leading to the need for more staff. So this is where we're going to get into the qualifications of these quote-unquote professionals, okay? So most of the staff were untrained children, many of whom were former participants of the camp. The camp also did not have any type of toilets or buildings. It was just nature. So Nadine, the kid that was at the camp, she recalls that the girls would often have to tie their hair up with tampons because they had a string on them. And they also had to carry packs everywhere with them, you know, to like carry their supplies and stuff. If they didn't tie their pack correctly and it fell apart, their punishment was carrying a rock in their pack. T-shirts were often used as toilet paper. So these are the dire situations that these children were unknowingly thrown into. So another important date that comes up in this documentary is June 27th, 1990. There's a call that comes in from Richfield Dispatch that a female from the camp was en route to the hospital. So Steve and Horsehair you know, get word of this, and they fly out to the scene where this girl had collapsed. And Debbie, Steve's wife, in the interview is like, oh, Steve was so distraught and so upset, but this was all beyond his control. So here's what happened. This female attendee of the camp has to be hospitalized, and this is 16-year-old Kristen Chase. She had been Uh, forced to go on a three-day-long hike in triple-degree heat without access to water. And she died of heat stroke. Kristen Chase had been sent to the camp by her mother, Sharon Fuqua, because she was struggling in school and dealing with substance abuse. She was failing 10th grade and overdosing on antidepressants. Fuqua was featured in the documentary, and in her interview, she recalled that Kristen was very sweet, lovable, and she loved dressing up as a child. But as she got older, she was having a hard time, and she became quote-unquote rebellious. So Fuqua thought that this camp would help Kristen. So the death of Kristen Chase led to the camp being raided by police, including Max Jackson, and they started pulling records from the Challenge Foundation's offices. Chase's autopsy also found that her internal organs showed signs of what they called exertional heat stroke. But this part was kind of confusing to me. So I can't remember who they're interviewing in this part, but they basically said that, yes, her internal organs showed signs of heat stroke, and that could have definitely played into the cause of death. But basically, there were other things that could have also contributed to the cause of death. And because there were other things contributing besides heat stroke, this gave police enough to charge Cartesano with negligent homicide. But they don't 
say in the documentary what these other things were that they found in the autopsy. Jackson said that this case absolutely consumed his life. So Max Jackson is like on it. He's very passionate. He's like, we're going to figure this out and help these kids. So he definitely had a passion for it, it seems like. Um, Cardassano automatically gets on the defense, though, because he's this is like his baby. So when he gets threatened because of this inconvenience, this poor teenage girl dying, he is like calling anybody who's against his program petty bureaucrats. He's like bitching in the media. And he basically was like, people who are against me are only against me because they're not taking the time to actually look at all the good that I'm doing. He even went on talk shows proclaiming his innocence and how all of this was ridiculous. He wasn't even at the camp when Kristen was there and he, quote unquote, didn't even know her. Which even if that's the case, like you started this camp, you're in charge of the staff. Like it's it's just like if if I did something at work that was irresponsible or unethical, that reflects on my boss, right? And my boss is then responsible for like disciplining me. So the fact that he just like came in and out as he pleased and at the very least was negligent because he wasn't watching his staff and making sure they were adequately trained, that's irresponsible. And then are you seriously going to tell me that putting teenagers in triple degree heat in the desert with no food and water or very little food and water is okay and safe. Like, how how the fuck is that your thought process? Steve Cartesano is the worst. This guy makes me so fucking mad. So, sorry, I'm going to be in a bad mood like this whole episode because I cannot stand this guy. So soon after Kristen Chase's death and the police like pulling records and stuff. It doesn't take long for them to get nine other allegations of abuse and a federal lawsuit settlement happens that ultimately shuts the program down in 1994. So the Challenger Foundation was no more in 1994. There was a lot of negative publicity. Cardassano, turns out, had been billing the children's insurance companies for quote-unquote treatment and getting a bunch of money. He had other charges brought up against him too. So there was charges of like negligence, intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud, and breach of contract. Charles Broffman was Cardassano's defense attorney at the time. So he's interviewed throughout the documentary as well. And so he helped Cardassano with all of his legal battles, which ultimately went on from August uh, 1989 to November 1993, which is the month and year that I was born. So this would have all been wrapping up like right when I came into the world, but there will be more to come later. You'll see. So regarding the death of Kristen Chase and the whole trial with that. So basically what Cardassano and his team had to do is they had to prove in court that this was an accident. Because if they could prove that it was an accident, then he couldn't be charged with any type of homicide or manslaughter. The jury deliberated for a day and they found Cardassano not guilty on all counts, finding that there was quote unquote reasonable doubt for Kristen's cause of death being exertional heat stroke. So basically, the autopsy results didn't give them enough information to be like, yeah, this was intentional. Like, she died from heat stroke, so how can we know if this was an accident or not? But my whole thing is, she should have never been out there in the first place. I don't, I don't know what kind of paperwork the, the parents had to sign or if there were waivers or how any of that worked, but I just, I don't understand how people can be so ignorant and irresponsible. And I'm specifically talking about the people who founded this camp. Like, why would you think this is a good idea? May 28th, 1992, Steve Cardassano and the Challenger Foundation were acquitted of five negligent homicide charges and nine misdemeanor counts of child abuse. 
There were numerous legal battles, though, of course. And so this was very expensive. Cardassano, who I thought was a millionaire, uh, filed for bankruptcy. And he started having significant difficulty finding employment. Debbie, his wife, didn't have access to the finances. So where all this money went that Cardassano earned... That's kind of a question mark here. I don't know how expensive doing all these legal battles was, you know, so maybe that's just me being ignorant. But if he made this much money, I'm surprised he had to file for bankruptcy. I don't know, especially with it being the 90s. That's just my thought. But so Debbie (laughs) had to start working at Sears and she said that she wanted Steve to stop doing these programs. She was like, "Okay, this was incredibly stressful. We had to file for bankruptcy. We have four young kids. We're clearly struggling here. Please stop with this program. Just get a like a simple job. Let's move on and be stable. But what's a guy to do? He can't just get a regular job. According to Steve, he's got a gift. He was born to work with kids. So he wasn't held legally responsible for anything. So how about we just do it all again and then we'll do it a third time. So, yes, the Challenger Foundation was done. But was Steve Cardassano done? No, sorry. So at this point, it's 1993, and the drug scare was continuing in the media. Cardassano had been blacklisted in the United States, but this wouldn't stop him from opening more camps. Healthcare America was the next camp that he opened. Why the fuck he named it Healthcare America, I don't know. You're not a healthcare professional, you fucking twat. This camp took kids from wealthy families to the Virgin Islands on St. Thomas, and they basically did exactly what they did at the Challenger Foundation, except instead of hiking everywhere, they're doing all this manual labor on the water on these boats. He used his background in film because he like studied film in college or something to make a promotional video for the camp. So it had high production. There were actors. He makes this video look really good and he's targeting wealthy families. So he makes this really nice brochure and he starts circulating these and he's advertising this as a pleasure cruise for children a pleasure cruise. And he charges even more money than he was before because these are rich families. Why wouldn't he? He got some of the wealthiest families to put their kids in this camp. You're going to hear some familiar names. The Rockefellers. Yeah, some of their kids were in this camp. Uh, The grandson of this Arkansas governor. And all of the families were told that this was a legitimate, credible program that would help their children become better people while also getting this beautiful scenery, this getaway, this socialization. Doctors were even showing these videos to their patients and advertising this as a legitimate option for management of behavioral health issues with their children. So of course, parents thought that this was good for their children. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, this was a total scam, but how would parents have known? Adam, who was 18, was a teenager that was sent to Healthcare America. When he was a kid and he was sent here, he had a lot of anger issues and he had been very violent. His father, Larry was gone all the time because he was working a lot. So he was pretty absent. And when Adam was flown out to St. Thomas, he was put on a boat for the next six and a half months. So they talk about him. They interview him in the documentary. And at one point, you know, he's, he's been here months, like I said. So one day, his dad, Larry, flew out and surprised him and visited him. And so Larry shows up, and this is all on camera, and you just see tiny 18-year-old Adam. He's, like, shirtless, sunburned, emaciated, and he's just, like, sobbing. And, like, he's just sobbing and blubbering. Like, you can see he's so clearly broken down, and he's just hugging his dad so tight, and he hugs him for such a long time. So it's, like, a really sad video. Adam went back to his home in Atlanta after the program, But after about a month, he slipped back into his old habits. And it's really sad because 
in an interview uh, as adults, Larry's like talking to his or yeah, Larry's talking to his child, Adam. And, you know, Adam now as an adult understands how abusive this was. But his father, Larry, doesn't understand that. And Larry tells Adam, I probably should have left you down there the rest of your life. And adult Adam is just looking at him like, I cannot believe my father just said this to me. And he's like, the rest of my life? And Larry goes, yeah, in the jungle. Like, just doubles down. So um, not all of the parents, in my opinion were the most caring and nurturing about their children in this documentary. I think most of them were and had good intentions, but this Larry guy really rubbed me the wrong way. And Adam's family spared no expense keeping him there all those six and a half months. They spent about 50 grand for him to stay there. Local authorities got word that a bunch of kids and a few adults showed up to this island, and the kids were very disheveled. And there seemed to be no structures there that they would have been staying in. So the authorities are looking into this like, who are these random people showing up to our island? What, what's up with all these kids? And the more that they look into it, they find that there was no such thing as Healthcare America. Steve had no license to be operating this camp. There were no public health inspections. They just picked a remote place, showed up, and hoped for the best. So another child that was at this camp was 15-year-old Ashley. She was there for nine months. And she says that the kids never had any idea where they were going. They were never told what the plan was. So I'm sure that was, like, very unnerving, you know, just not knowing where you are all the time and what you're going to be doing. So he's holding these kids hostage on this boat and they flee to various islands all over the Caribbean. Steve Cardassano took these kids to Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Venezuela, Jamaica, and Colombia. And this is because he knew that the feds were after him and on to him. They knew that he didn't have a license. They're trying to, like, track him down. So he would just go to these different islands, and they would stay long enough to, like, gather supplies, and then they would just flee to the next place. In Puerto Rico, several teens ended up escaping, and they, like, ran away into this island. They get into a village, and they're trying to find people to get help. But the captain tracked them down. And my understanding, this part was kind of confusing, but my understanding is he does this in, like, broad daylight in public. So other people saw this, and he puts... So this captain who I don't think was Cardassano. I think it was somebody else. But he put nooses around these kids' necks. He, like, finds them and is like, how dare you run away? And he puts these nooses around their necks, and then he ties them to a car. And he's like, this is your punishment. Now you can't get away. But Puerto Rican authorities get word of this. I'm sure all these villagers were like, what the hell is happening? And they called the police. So the authorities show up. And they rescued these teenagers and sent them back home. Katie, who is Steve Cardassano's daughter, is then interviewed at this point in the documentary. So she starts talking about how, meanwhile, the Cardassanos are continuing to have a lot of financial struggles, but she talks, like, very highly of her dad. She's talking about how he's a genius, the smartest person she's ever met. She also often would, like, beg her dad to change career paths and do something else because she wanted them to have a normal life, too. But he was just, like, not listening to her. And... This is where we start to get into some of the trouble that, ironically, Steve Cardassano's children are experiencing themselves. So, like I said, he had four kids. Uh, the ones that are mentioned in this, in this uh, documentary are David and Katie. I don't know the situation of the other two, but David and Katie both had drug problems. David started getting into drugs when he was 12 years old, like very, very heavily. So it seems like Steve totally had this savior mentality. Like, if I can't save my kids, I'm going to save other kids. Focus on your own kids, dude. So all of these legal troubles are now catching up to Healthcare America. And it seems like after the whole Puerto Rico incident, 
everyone finally caught up to Steve Cardasano and they shut down the Healthcare America group. He can't run that camp anymore. But wouldn't you know, by the time it's the 2000s, he's at it again. So Steve Cardasano opened another camp. This time it was called Pacific Coast Academy, like Zoe 101. And he does this in Samoa. Also, I think the reason he was able to get away from with this for a third time is because he founded this group under the name Steve Michaels. So he puts this whole foundation under a false name. And interestingly, this is when Cardasano sends his son, David, along with him. So David has this drug problem and he's like, you're going to go to this camp. And in the documentary, they're interviewing Steve's ex-wife, Debbie. And she's openly admitting that David, like they had David kidnapped by two men who like bound him, threw him in a car and then put him on a plane and all that and like took him to this camp. So she's like openly admitting to traumatizing her child. Another child that was at this camp is 16-year-old Kurt. And he attended this camp and is also interviewed as an adult. He uh, starts talking about how his mom decided to send him here because they got this like really nice brochure and the price of the camp was $25,000. His mom sold their house so that Kurt could go to this camp. I don't really know what Kurt was struggling with and why they sent him here, but I I cannot believe that his mom sold their house so that I, so that he could go. That's just insane. Kurt stayed at this camp for a pretty long time and he became junior staff, so very similar to the Challenger Foundation. They start having all of these kids turn into staff. They're not trained they're not professionals, you know. So Amber was another child at Pacific Coast Academy, and Amber knew Kurt personally. They grew up in the same area. Uh, they were friends before this. So when Amber sees Kurt there, she's like relieved. She's like, oh, thank God, someone else is here that I know. And Amber had been struggling with substance abuse and was put in the camp when she was only 14 years old. Similar to... The other camps that Cardasano has run, Amber says that she only met Steve Cardasano once, and it was because he was just coming to check in on David, his son. So it seems like Steve was constantly in and out and again, letting the other staff run things while he worked odd jobs. This is when we get into another really important point, a big turning point in the documentary. So at Pacific Coast Academy, there was a child that was making these secret videotapes about what was really going on behind the scenes at this camp. And this videotape eventually becomes public. It's brought to authorities. It gets out. They show footage from these tapes. And I just want to give you a trigger warning. If you do watch this, the tapes are very disturbing. It shows these children that were emaciated. Uh, they're dirty. They are covered in insect bites. And I can't remember who says this in the documentary, but he says they were living like animals are his words as they're like describing the contents of the tapes. There's this clip in the videos, too, that like zooms in on this child's hands and they're just covered completely in all of these bumps. And th these are insect bites. And the person that was making this tape is also just interviewing the kids and they're talking about the horrible things that they're experiencing there and how miserable they are. None of them are like, oh my God, this is so much fun. Wow, this has changed my life. Whereas some of the videos that you see for the Challenger Foundation, the first camp, could be coerced, but there's some kids that are like, I'm thinking differently about how I talk to my parents and I'm, you know, I'm glad that I came here and I feel like more disciplined now. I feel like a changed person, blah, blah, blah. All the people in this tape, all these kids are like, dude, this sucks. I hate this. One child in the videotape said that he had been there uh, like in and out of this camp several times and he had been living there for about a year. Another child in the video says, quote, I'm 18 and it's illegal for them to keep me here, but they refuse to let me go, end quote. 
that's pretty damning, right? The kids also talk about how they were sleeping on the ground, and there's videos of, like, their sleeping arrangement. One kid reported being beaten and forced to stay awake all night on his hands and knees with his hands above his head as punishment for whatever he did wrong. And this place, just like all of the other ones, had no buildings. They just showed up to this land in Samoa, and they forced the children to build toilets, buildings, and sewers. Uh, They were building roads and pipes. So it's like Cartasano wanted them to finally be able to settle somewhere long term. But this was like a forced labor camp with extremely inhumane conditions and its children. So just super bleak. So let's go back to Amber now. Amber is interviewed in this secret videotape, and she talks about how she had been at Pacific Coast Academy for about 16 months. And when she first was brought to the camp, she was hogtied, slammed on the ground, and She's in the middle of, like, explaining all this in the tape. They're, like, outside. It's broad daylight. And so she's like, yeah, they slay me on the ground, blah, blah, blah. And then she, like, stops talking for a second. And she goes, shit, the staff is listening. And then she stops talking. And she's, like, clearly emotional. You can tell that she's, like, trying to desperately get this information out on tape. But she's very scared of the staff. So she, like, immediately stops talking. So then it cuts to adult Amber. And she is talking about the horrible things that she experienced while she was at this camp. Specifically, she starts talking about, and trigger warning, a time when she was sexually assaulted. So the way that Amber tells it is a camp leader told her for whatever reason that she had to go to isolation. She said she hadn't done anything wrong, so she didn't understand why she was supposed to go to isolation. Four students then forced her down on the ground and tied her up, including Kurt, the friend that she had known before. So then they're cutting over to interviewing Kurt as an adult, and Kurt says that, like, he remembered tying her up to a pole in the hut, that her hands were turning purple and blue, and that he just tied her up because that's what he had to do. Like, he didn't want to disobey the other leaders. They kept Amber tied up like this, for two days, and when she would fall asleep, they would throw buckets of water on her to keep her awake. She was then taken to isolation, where she was sexually assaulted by the chief of the village. So the chief of this village in Samoa at the time was a chief named Tui, T-U-I, and this allegedly happened while his family was gone at church. A few days later, Amber told a camp leader about this, which takes a lot of courage. Like, most people don't report their assaults because of fear of repercussions and, like, stigmas. So it's amazing that she did this, and I'm very proud of her. But unfortunately, the camp leader's response was that Amber was blowing things out of proportion. And the camp leader did nothing about this assault. So eventually... PCA gets word about this videotape, but by the time they find out, authorities have gotten a hold of it. So again, this part was kind of confusing to me. So when PCA gets word that this videotape has gotten out and what is on it, they are trying to do everything that they can to stop this tape from getting over into the U.S. and going public. So they basically contacted the Samoan authorities at the airport and They're doing everything they can to prevent this guy from getting out of the country. So this is really confusing to me, but what I gathered in the interview is basically like this guy that was either at the camp or a family member got the tape, got to the airport, and was going to fly back to the U.S. and give it to the authorities. But I guess someone ratted, and so then PCA contacted the Samoan authorities at the airport I don't know what they told the Samoan authorities, but they were trying to get them to track this guy down and prevent him from leaving the airport. But they were unsuccessful, and Steve's daughter, Katie, 
and and the documentary is all pissed off and she's like this is so unfair steve was barely even a part of it at this point and his name's being tied to it i'm like girl how are you this naive he did this so many times and was not there for you as as a dad it sounds like like it's just sad so pca was then raided (laughs) This is in 2001. Mary Lou, a former employee for the U.S. Embassy, was involved in the rescue. And in her interview, she recalls that they gained entry to the camp. When they got there, it was like super quiet. They're not seeing anybody. And they're kind of worried. They're like, are we at the wrong spot? What's going on? But then the embassy officials got deeper and deeper into the camp. And they found one child who told them that everyone was gone. Everyone had deliberately been removed from the camp. So once again, they're fleeing. They're in hiding. And Amber was one of the kids that was forcibly removed. So she said that they were taken to a beach, but the U.S. Embassy reacted quickly. And they're like driving around and hunting for them. And they find the beach somehow where these kids are at. So Amber recalled black SUVs with blackout windows pulling up filled with authorities And this is so sad. Um, Amber in her video talks about how shocked she was when they showed up. And she says, quote, there's no way. There's no way these people are here and care about us, especially me. And that was so heartbreaking to me because it's like she was a teenager taken here in the middle of nowhere against her will. She's been tortured, abused, assaulted, completely broken down. So (laughs) these people that show up to, like, rescue her, she's like, she just can't believe they even give a shit about her. Like, it's just so sad. As a result of the work that the embassy did, 23 teenagers were rescued, and this videotape became the primary evidence used for legal action against Cartesano and Pacific Coast Academy. Meanwhile, think about the timing here. This is 2001, and this is August. This is right before... 9-11. So 9-11 happens and priorities for law enforcement shift. Trying really hard not to get mad. Cardasano's attorneys get him off. Again, he's acquitted for everything. And as a thank you, Cardasano then stiffs his attorney, doesn't pay him a dime, which was hilarious, by the way, because the attorney was like, one thing I just couldn't stand was the fact that he stiffed me and never talked to me again. Not the abuse, not the horrific things that he did, just that he stiffed me. It's like, serves you right, you fucking asshole. (laughs) So all these legal actions are again going on with Cardasano, and this is when his daughter Katie really starts struggling with drugs. She's stealing things from her house and selling them for drugs. She was heavily using heroin. She overdosed multiple times. She got in a really bad car accident and got arrested. And Debbie says that when Katie got arrested, they left her in the jail because she had to learn her lesson and they knew better than to bail her out because they had bailed their son out multiple times. So make of that what you will. But Katie's clearly struggling. Uh, She does get out of prison. And when she gets out of prison, her dad, Steve Cardasano, is diagnosed with grade four colon cancer. Katie went through recovery for the next 13 years. But David, to this day, continues to deal with drugs. He is not interviewed at all in this documentary because at the time he was in prison. I don't know if he still is. And Steve Cardasano battled with cancer for six or seven years. He died later from a heart attack in May 2019 when he was 63 years old. And like a lot of these stories, it wasn't until after the abuser died that many victims were able to gather that courage to speak out about the horrific abuse that they endured at the hands of Steve Cardasano and his employees. So not just his employees. He was in and out, but he was doing shit too. So it's at this point in the documentary where they cut to Kenny's interview. So she was one of the kids at the Challenger Foundation. She was taken there when she was 13. Kenny 
starts to talk about what happened to her. So there was this situation where she was forcibly isolated at the camp as part of a quote-unquote solo experience. Sounds a lot like what happened to Amber at PCA. And Steve was there when this happened. And Steve assured Kenny that she would be fine and that this isolation would be good for her. And he gave her a walkie-talkie and told her not to worry and that if she needed anything to just call and that he would personally come to Kenny and bring her what she needed. So at one point, Kenny, trusting the adults, the professional, the founder, the president of this camp, calls him. Her skin was extremely dry and itchy because they're in the desert. So she asked him to bring her some lotion. So he did. Then he offers to rub the lotion on her back. And then he tells her to lay on her stomach. He then straddled her and rubs the lotion all over her. Then he starts rubbing it on her front side. And then he assaulted her. And this is so fucking disturbing to me. Kenny says that one of the things he said to her is, it's not a big deal. Think of me like your father. And Kenny, as an adult, when she's being interviewed, is like horrified. And she's like, I, I couldn't believe he said that to me because like my father would never do that to me. And I don't want to speculate or allege anything, but I think it is really interesting that he used those words. Think of me like your father. And he was a father to four children. Just things to think about. And Kenny talks about how she was groomed by Steve throughout her time at the camp. And she, of course, didn't realize this until she was an adult. Kenny did tell her mother about what happened to her. And her mother did nothing because, according to Kenny, her mom was like, well, he's doing good for the kids. And she didn't want to cause a stir. It's just, this is one of those stories that is so frustrating to me because it is adults letting vulnerable children down over and over and over again. I hate it. I was like screaming at my TV the whole time I was watching it. I was getting so mad. Oh, oh my God, I'm getting so emotional. Okay, we're almost done. But it's just so horrible. And Kenny also talked about like how ironic it was in all of his interviews that he constantly called kids these master manipulators when meanwhile, he was the greatest manipulator of them all. He fooled everyone. Oh my God, okay. Also pretty damning, in my opinion, allegedly, the Cartesano family did not deny the sexual assault allegations. They just said that they felt this behavior didn't align with their memory of who Steve was as a person. So I feel like that says a lot. Before we get into the, dis into the discussion, I could not speak. Before we get into the discussion, I just want to say, if you or someone you know has experienced abuse information and resources are available at wantatalkaboutit.com. So some discussion questions to think about as we wrap things up. This continues to be a huge industry. This year, according to the Hell Camp documentary, thousands of children will take part in a wilderness therapy camp. Do we think that these types of programs, not saying the Challenger Foundation and Steve Cardisano specifically, but do we think the wilderness therapy could be beneficial to children? Do we think that they could stop substance abuse? Do we think that they have the tools and resources to treat mental health disorders? Do we know what to be looking for if we send our children to these camps? Do we know what questions to ask? Do we know how much these things should cost? Another discussion thing that I want people to be thinking about, drop it in the comments. When I say discussion, like I want to hear y'all's thoughts on these things. Another thing that came up in this to me was it made me think about the prison system because these children were brought here forcibly. They're not being treated like humans. So it brings up that concept of prison and how it's not really rehabilitation. Or is it to you? To me, it's not. But we can talk about it. 
Abuse resulting in permanent trauma makes it incredibly difficult for people to return to normal living, and it impacts decision-making in the future. So do camps like this, specifically now talking about these abusive camps, (laughs) have any positives, or is it just making it even harder for these kids to make a future for themselves and live a successful life? Steve Cardasano himself was abused. And instead of breaking the cycle, he chose to abuse others. Another discussion question. Should parents be held accountable for what happened? What's your opinion on that? What role should parents play with their children? How should they discipline their children? Is this type of like disciplinarian mentality, is this effective? According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, quote, Corporal punishment is of limited effectiveness and has potentially deleterious side effects. The American Academy of Pediatrics has said this in a policy statement. This was a 2002 analysis of studies published by the Psychological Bulletin that concluded, although corporal punishment can make a child obey in the short run, it also is linked with a number of long-term problems including mental disorders and behavioral difficulties. Spanking in childhood has also been related to criminality. Too much corporal punishment can also damage the parent-child relationship, as the parent becomes the source of both nurturing and danger. Disconcertingly, spanking in childhood is also associated with approval of hitting a spouse and increased marital conflict. End quote. So things to think about here. Uh, What was going on in this time period that made parents think treating their children like this was in any way acceptable? Like if they knew what was going on here. People say all the time, well, well, that was the time. These were the 80s. Okay, but like, why was it that way? What are your thoughts on that? And then my other big question, where do we think all of this money was going? Cartesano made millions and millions of dollars. Where did where did it all go? I don't understand. (laughs) So, okay, that wraps everything up. But that is the Hell Camp documentary. You can watch it on Netflix. I hope you guys enjoyed this special Patreon leak and this coverage on Hell Camp. If you did, be sure to let me know if you're watching, or I guess I should say listening, (laughs) on YouTube. Let me know down in the comments what you thought. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. That way you know when new episodes have been released. And if you are listening on a podcast platform, it would mean the world to me if you left a five-star review, because each time you do that, it helps put the show in front of other listeners. It boosts it up the algorithms. So please go do that if you haven't. I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you all stay safe, and I will talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. Hosted, written, and produced by Kadra Brennan. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell the world about it by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leaving a five-star review. It helps the show more than you know. Contact, support, and merch links can be found in the episode description. And if you have a story to share or a topic request, send an email to perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. Cager would love to read your story on the podcast. Until next week, stay curious.